I've probably been Dominic's motivation since his very first practice. Beating guys who've been preparing for a single fight against me for years. Dream crushing isn't always as easy as it looks. And with that, welcome to Early Stop, which is show with news of the day. You should give just enough time, but sometimes not enough. If this is your first time stopping by, we thank you. And get ready for something you won't find anywhere else. I'm John Franklin, and I'm joined as always by the godfather of Fight Night Picks, Craig Allen. Craig, how are you? John, I'm well. Um, you know what? You know, early stoppage aside, I'm starting to slip behind in the old Fight Night Picks predictions uh, ranks. I'm still ahead of Matt by quite a bit, but I was feeling drippy today. I was feeling the Canadian drip. I want to get this nice maple leaf encrusted trophy back. So I tossed on the World Championship Canadian uh, jersey. And then I figured I'd break out the newest addition to the Fight Night Picks roster in the office. See, I have a nice piece of memorabilia, Canadian flag, signed by none other than, can you guess who? First Canadian UFC champ. Oh, who was the first Canadian? It was almost Harold Clarence Howard. Who was the first Who said, if you're coming on, come on. Who was the first Canadian champ? Carlos Newton. That's right. I forgot Carlos Newton was Canadian. <laughs> uh, Big Carlos Newton fan. Forget about Matt Hughes. Carlos Newton, George St. Pierre, all day. All day. All day, every day. That's 170. On this episode of Early Stoppage, we talk Rocky and the Boogeyman, Bobby Knuckles 9000, and I think this is pronounced Bellator. Is it Bellator? Bellator. The prelims are going on as we speak. The prelims of Bellator. <laughs> Uh, no, it's Bellator. You heard that right. We'll talk Bellator on this episode of Early Stoppage. But we begin, Craig, with Khabib Nurmagomedov. Khabib sorted Justin Gaethje out quick with a second-round triangle. Then he proceeded to request uh, a lot of things in his post-fight um, interview, most notably to be listed at the top of the pound-for-pound -pound rankings, which we will get to later. And he dropped the gloves on the canvas and rode off into the sunset. Craig, the big question is, will we ever see – Khabib Nurmagomedov in a UFC cage again. Ben, j'ai mon jersey ici pour raison. And again, there's a reason why I'm repping the jersey. Because there's only one fight I see Monsieur Nurmagomedov taking. And it's a fight against my beloved Georges St. Pierre. That's the only fight. I mean, we've been talking about that in the lead up to this fight card. And first and foremost, I have to say, all debate aside about how the pound for pound rankings are made... Habib's got to be your number one, right? I mean, you can make a case for George St. Or sorry, not George St. Pierre, for John Jones. John Jones made a pretty good case for himself, although I think he muddied it up after tweet 48, 49, 50, 51. What a donkey. But for me, Habib in his last three fights has looked absolutely amazing. On this win streak, it's been amazing. But finishing the top-level guys, submitting Conor McGregor, submitting Dustin Poirier, the master class that he put on against um, Justin Gaethje was amazing. The only thing you can criticize is what? He got kicked to the legs a little bit, but he marched forward like the Korean zombie normally would. And then that sequence to finish the fight was amazing. So to really answer the question, will we ever see him back in an octagon? I don't see him coming back for a Connor fight. He's set for money. He doesn't need that. I feel like Habib's just going to kind of go back into the shadows, if you will, He'll, he'll either help out at AKA or just hang out at home in Dagestan and kind of pick up the torch um, where his dad left it. He'll start training, building camps, building teams, and training that next generation of fighters. And I mean, you know, the conversation is now in five years and 10 years, how many champions will we have from that area of the world? Well, again, the Islam Makachevs, you've got so many different fighters. Zabit Magomed Sharipov, you have fighters in the PFL, you have fighters in Bellator, Usman Nurmagomedov just signed with Bellator. You've got Umar Nurmagomedov with UFC. There's so many fighters from his inner circle that we're starting to see pop up. So I think he takes a bit of a step back to kind of flourish in that role. But if not, I would think it would be the fight against GSP. And the last time I checked, Mr. Georges St. Pierre, he's doing a lot of interviews. So he's starting to kind of get that rumor mill spinning again. But he's getting older. He's not getting any younger. So if it's going to be a fight, I would think it would happen in the next, what, year or so? Because if it's not going to happen, I don't think it ever happens. If it doesn't happen anytime soon, it's never going to happen. Here's where it gets interesting for me, and that's they would have to break a lot of precedent for George St. Pierre to fight uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov, meaning this. Obviously, with Khabib um, retiring, it takes the belt off of his waist, right, or it will. 
So then the question becomes, well, if George St. Pierre comes back to fight Khabib Namagamadoff, what do they fight at and what do they fight for? How is it not the main event, but there's no belt? Now, the easy situation to fix that would be to create a 165-pound belt and have them fight for it. Dana White said he won't do that. But here's my thing with him coming back in the octagon is that most of the things – I have a lot of different thoughts about Khabib. And honestly, you know, in the rundown later, we're going to rank our uh, – Pound for pound all time, which you've obviously already jumped a gun on, but we still have some fun with it. Um, <laughs> Khabib definitely sticks to his word. When he says he's going to do something, he typically does it. He, when, he, when he tells you he's never going to fight Conor McGregor again, you should believe him. When he tells you he's never going to step in the octagon again, you should believe him. Most people use this as an opportunity to uh, drum up some you know, interest in a fight, pulling them out of retirement. I don't see that with him. The best case scenario for me, which will never happen, would be George St. Pierre and Khabib Nurmagomedov fighting in a co-promoted fight outside of the UFC where they get all the money and it's in Russia. I think that'd be great. Now, the legalities of that being of that happening, because they don't have any belts tying them up. The legalities of that- Do it in Montreal. Yeah, could be. The legalities of that happening are pretty much impossible. There's no way Dana White's going to let that happen without you know having some input on that, even though it's happening between two retired fighters. So that's- a story for another day, but I, yeah, I don't think we're going to see him in the octagon again, just because there's too many hoops that he has to jump through to get there. And I mean, we'll move forward just as long as it's not promoted by golden boy promotion. So we'll stay with Habib kind of, and in the wake of Habib's victory, his pound for pound ranking is now number one. And John Jones came out to make the case that he keeps that rank. I mean, that number one spot, so coveted, so heralded, and really, you look at what happened. I mean, a lot of people are calling John Jones petty. Some think that it's justified with what Jones said on Twitter. What say you, John, but not John Jones, John Franklin? Is this John Jones actually being petty and just continuing to throw shade at AKA, or is he right in this spot? I think he's right that he shouldn't be so easily dismissed um, in this discussion because, listen, I'm going to say a lot of things, that, and we'll really get into this and rank them, but I'm going to say a lot of things here that a lot of people are going to have some problems with. Number one is that Khabib Nurmagomedov retired in the cage. You're not eligible for rankings if you're retired. That's number one. So, so you can make the case he shouldn't even be eligible to be a pound-for-pound fighter, but that's a different discussion. But I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. The second thing being that, listen, and this is going to be my big argument, or would have been my big argument and rank them because we're, we're really – throwing a lot of uh, things that would be in that segment into other segments. But um, Khabib Nurmagomedov was fighting on the prelims like five fights ago. So that's, you know, you can say what you want to about that. But if he was this great, amazing, heralded fighter, he would have a much longer reign and run than being on just the, just getting on the main card, Craig. Just getting on the main card. So let's talk about John Jones, though. I do think John Jones' length of time that he's been relevant, I think that he has a case, and I understand why he's saying it. I think, I honestly think it's okay for him to not give that mantle up so easily. I don't think that he should just have to throw Khabib his flowers and say, hey, man, great, you're number one. I'll just step aside and let you have it when there's such a difference in their resumes. And Khabib has a a good one, but Jones has a great one. And it depends on where you stand in terms of, is it something for now or is it something for all time? To really attack one of your points. I mean, you're saying if you're, uh, you know, a retired fighter, you shouldn't be a part of the pound for pound rankings. I'm looking at the UFC's pound for pound rankings. Number 11, Conor McGregor. Is he, or is he not retired? John Franklin. He's not, he's got a fight with Dustin Poirier coming up. Is it booked? It might. <laughs> is any Connor fight ever booked before, you know, a couple? He's training for it. But go ahead. Don't be a dingus. All right. No, I'm kidding. I look at this and you're right. I agree with you. You look at John Jones' total body of work. And again, I'm not going to get too far into it. But yes, it's more prestigious than Habib's. But Habib's last three wins in the greatest division in MMA right now, in the biggest organization, and you beat the top three guys. What was the narrative before this fight? Justin Gaethje has a perfect style to beat Habib, and he clowned him. That finishing sequence was amazing. So I ask- think that, that that means a lot more. Hold on. I think that means a lot more than a win over a washed-up Gustafson, than a win over blown-up Tiago Santos, blown-up Anthony Smith, Dominic Reyes. 
I think that Habib's last three wins solidify that case that he should be number one pound for pound at this current juncture over John Jones. I don't care about John Jones wins from 2010 to 2012. They don't really factor into that discussion right now. Right now, who's the best pound for pound fighter? Habib Nurmagomedov. All time, different discussion. Right now, Habib Nurmagomedov. All right, it's a good thing that we clipped these because we're stepping all over the rank of segment. But let me transition this question then. Hold on. The better question is, is this good? Is this good for John Jones? Is it good for him to even start this argument? I mean, you you keep yourself relevant. You're between divisions. You don't have a belt. So you can kind of say, hey, I should be the number one guy. The conversation should revolve around me. But apart from that, I, I don't see what, what's the merit. What's really the merit to John Jones doing this other than getting his name out in the headlines? Is there anything? Does it mean anything? Really, the pound for pound rankings don't mean a whole heck of a lot. I mean, it meant a lot personally to Habib. Probably means a lot to the person that's in number one. But other than John Jones getting his name out there, does being number one pound for pound help sell a fight with Stipe? Well, sure it does. But in the grand scheme of things, how many buys does that translate to? Now, I know that seems like a silly question. I hate the UFC rankings as much as the next guy. But does it mean a lot? Well, I'll put it to you like this. If, if LeBron James is constantly being compared to Michael Jordan, Tom Brady is compared to Joe Montana and whoever, you know, in other sports, baseball doesn't really get into this as much. Uh, probably because we don't have a generation. Oh, Clayton Kershaw, the next Sandy Koufax. Now well, he's a we champ. Don't, we don't have a generational uh, talent in the field right now. Um, like, like we have Mookie Betts? Eh, he's not there yet. So, yeah, Mookie Give Betts. Give me a break. Mookie Betts, listen, Mookie, I don't want to turn this into a baseball discussion, but Mookie Betts can hang with all those guys. I still know that he quite has the resume yet. So but we'll get there. Here's my point. My point is, is that I think if you're John Jones um, and you've gone on the run that you've gone on, the way to keep yourself motivated is this. Because he has accomplished things no one else has accomplished. And I think that that, for me, is kind of where a lot of this is coming from. All right, Craig. All right. We move on for the category of be careful what you wish for, Leon Edwards. Leon, who was having issue with losing his ranking due to inactivity, now looks to have a date with Kamzat Shemaev. Craig, I don't want to be lazy here uh, with my question, but let's attack this from all angles. I'm certain I've heard that somewhere before. Must have been in a previous a life. It used to be a show. A podcast? It used to be a podcast somewhere else in a previous life. Anyway, Craig, let's hit it. Uh, let's hit it all. Did the UFC handle this properly? Does Edwards deserve this, uh, this type of treatment? Is this too much too soon for Chimaev? Give me the goods on this matchup, how it came to be, and what your thoughts are on it. So I put my hands up to start, and I went over to the UFC rankings so we could talk about a couple of different segments here. So last week, to give a little bit of a backstory, there was a couple of people out there that said Leon Edwards is off the, the overall rankings. Um, then it was they're off of the rankings on TSN's website, corroborated by Aaron Bronstetter, and now he's off the UFC's rankings. I have the UFC's rankings in front of me. He's at number three. Habib moved up to number one in the pound for pound rankings. So to me, it looks like Leon Edwards is back at number three. Is that what it looks like to you? That's what it seems like to me anyway. I mean, maybe I'm mistaken, but that's what I see right in front of me in the screen. I see my lovely face. I see a guy with a blue shirt and blue curtains. And then I see rankings with Leon Edwards at number three. This is such a long shot for Hamzat Shemaev. And don't make don't let that seem like I'm pumping the brakes on Shemaev. Craig Allen, huge Shemaev guy, big on him when he came out from Brave. This sounds like a speech here. But <laughs> overall, this is way too big of a step up. You don't beat John Phillips, Reese McKee, Gerald Mearshart. Number three, Leon Edwards, it's in line for title shot. That It just seems like too much. Now, I get it. The argument for this is, well, he's ran through his opponents. I know. I, I watched the, the fights with my own two eyes that are looking at Leon Edwards, number three in the rankings. So, to me, it seems like way too big of a step up. I mean, why wouldn't you do, I don't know, like Tyron Woodley. I know he's on a downturn. There, you beat a former champ. Now you fight a guy way up there. Or have him fight, like, a guy that's, like, I know RDA is a fight. Uh, nobody wants to fight Jeff Neal. I know Jeff Neal went through some sickness. Vicente Luque, your people's champ. Nate Diaz, Pettis. Like, why not a fight like that? Take Mike Perry out of his fight with uh, Robbie Lawler. That doesn't seem to be promoted anymore. Have him fight Robbie Lawler. There's so many different fights to make in there. Why do you have to make the fight with number three, Leon Edwards? 
And then what happens? What if Leon Edwards wins a boring decision? I hate to say it. I like Leon Edwards a lot. What happens if Leon Edwards goes out there, outboxes him, out wrestles him, outlasts him, and his cardio is great? Well, then what do you do? Hamzat Shmai have lost to the third ranked guy. So does, do we just send him back down to the prelims, send him back down to the, the guys that aren't in the top 15 and let him beat up some cans? No, this isn't Bellator. This isn't Michael Venom Page. So work this guy up. Don't take the, and, and it's a bit of a stretch to say the Bellator approach, but don't have him fight the guy so far up there that you, you can never come back to that. I think it's a little silly, but I mean, kudos to Hamzat Shemaev. Shoot your shot, man. That's a great fight. You know, you took it from the Kamzat Shemaev perspective, so I'll take it from the Leon Edwards perspective. Uh, this is bully tactics. There's no other way to look at it. I mean, first you remove the guy's ranking, then you got him fighting, you know, one of the a guy who's, you know, ransacking everybody who's just not even uh, really a ranked fighter. If he is, he's barely ranked. So to me, this is a punishment to Leon Edwards more than it is a gift to Kamzat Shemaev. It's unfair. I mean, Leon Edwards has been trying to book a title fight forever they won't give it to him what the way i perceive this and the way this feels to me is leon we've offered you a bunch of fights you've said no to them we took away your ranking if you want it back you got to fight this kid that's to me it's to me that they're, they're painting him into a corner and because they are not willing to give him what he wants they're taking it like he's being an unagreeable partner when not for nothing if not for a pandemic the guys are fought tyron woodley that's not his fault that's it that's it's it. That's the weird thing. But that's that that fight didn't happen. So you want to you want to take him through the ringer through all this stuff like he's being super difficult. I think that if in other circumstances the Woodley fight goes through and then what are we talking about? I mean, the, the most unfair part of that is the fact that, you know, they like you said, they painted him into a corner. That was supposed to be the main event over in London. That card was when the world was starting to shut down. So they took the Darren Stewart fight against Bartosz Fabinski, threw that on a Cage Warriors card in a different city. And then poor Leon Edwards is left without a dance partner. What happens? Woodley fights Burns. Burns beats the piss out of him. And then Burns is the next in line for a title shot. Oh, wait, record scratch. That fight's not going to happen anytime soon. So Usman ends up fighting Masvidal. Burns on the back burner. Burns gets the fight. The fight falls out. And now Leon Edwards is really the odd man out. Like Tyron Woodley's star has fallen so far, but Leon Edwards' rank is still there. So we're going to take the rank away from him. And oh, by the way, like you said, you're going to fight an unranked phenom and we'll see what happens. Yeah, th this is ridiculous. This this type of stuff wouldn't happen to Fabian Edwards over in Bellator. No, it wouldn't. You know, real quick before we move on, uh, you know, it's weird. Edwards is a victim of what is really at 170 he's kind of a victim of circumstance in the sense that there's so many fighters that they want to put in quote the right fight and make sure that they don't like burn their star because honestly, you know, and we, we discussed this. And I know that I was on the other side of this issue, but for the purposes, you know, I have situational ethics. So for the purposes of this discussion, I'm, I'm on the opposite side of my old, of my old take, but you know, Edward should have fought Masvidal. They had some heat there. Edward should have fought Covington. There was something that, like all these fights that should have happened haven't happened because you want to wait to match Covington up with a certain guy or wait to what match uh, to match up Masvidal with a certain guy or wait to match up Usman with a certain guy. There's eight guys in this division. He should have fought by now. And he has it because eight guys, because here's the reason why they know that Leon Edwards is the fly in the ointment. They know that Leon Edwards could take any of these guys out. And yet he, he himself is not marketable. So he goes, he goes ahead, and he's not also always agreeable. So he goes ahead and upsets the apple cart, and now you have a champion that you don't want, and what, do you, what can you do with it? Well, let's parlay that into the next topic, John, because Charles Oliveira is in the same spot, and he's a crafty guy. He's on a seven-fight finish streak. He capped that off by beating Kevin Lee back in the spring, main event win in Brazil as the world was shutting down. And, I mean, you look at it right now. So we talk about the rankings. So. Charles Oliveira is ranked sixth in the lightweight division. And what does he want to do? He wants to fast track himself to a title shot with the UFC creating what? A Grand Prix. I mean, now that might be on the Scott Coker combo plate at the Windstar World Casino. But will Dana White bite on the idea of having a Grand Prix tournament? Or does McGregor Poirier too? Is that really the be all end all of this lightweight division as it stands right now? Because that top eight is spicy. 
You know, I don't think Dana will do a Grand Prix because I think that Dana thinks it's opening the door for too many things. One, it makes him look like Bellator. It makes him look like PFL. Two, it makes him look like the way UFC used to be run. And they're like, okay, if you'll do, uh, obviously the, the, the governing bodies, and maybe they will, won't let the UFC do a one-night tournament. But I guess maybe from Dana's perspective or the fans' perspective, they say, okay, if you won't do a one-night tournament, why not put these guys all fighting on the, on the same night in the, the first round, in the semis, it, like have it all happen on the same night. Um, so I just don't think he wants to open that door. I don't think that he thinks that there's – and honestly, if you do something like that, he does lose control in a certain way because now you've, you've sort of made up this, this, um, this tournament structure, and if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, you can't move things around because you've already seeded everybody. So it gets a little bit difficult to – he loses control of the situation. So, yeah, do I think – that they should have a tournament. I think it'd be a lot of fun. I just don't think it's the UFC brand. And uh, it does leave guys like Charles, Charles Oliveira out in the cold. Because the whole point of a tournament, uh, by my definition of a tournament, is that you use the tournament to promote the guy that ultimately wins the tournament. So they win the first round, they win the second round, they win the semifinals, they win the finals. Now you have this body of work to show fans that once they're champion, which was what Bellator did, which made it, which was a great... Um, Way to do things. It's a pretty good business model. You build the guy up in the tournament, and then once he wins it, now you have the same thing they do in tough. You build a guy up in a certain way so that when he wins, you have something. And then he fights the middleweight champ because you're sucked dry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We'll get into that later. But, I mean, I look at this lightweight division. I'll be totally honest. Number eight and number seven aren't the most marketable guys. Number seven more so than number eight. And here's the reason being. You have Carlos Diego Fajay at eight who's like a people's champ type of fighter, like Charles Oliveira, like a Dan Hooker. Seven, you have Paul Felder. Probably not going to see Paul Felder make it out of that quarterfinals. I don't think so, quite honestly, being the fight night picks guy. But after that, you have Oliveira, you have Hooker, McGregor, Ferguson, Poirier, Gaethje. Then you have your champ, but I mean, automatically you take him out. So I, I think it'd be fun, but you're right. I don't think they'll do it. And I think the main reason why Bellator's done it. Bellator's really kind of saturated the market. And Bellator's had issues due to the current state of the world that they pretty well had to ice the tournament that they have going on right now at 145 pounds. So for all those reasons, logistical reasons, I mean, the majority of those fighters train in the States with Gaethje, Poirier, Ferguson, McGregor's in Ireland, Hooker's in uh, New Zealand, Oliver's in Brazil, Felder's in the States, and then Carlos Diego Fajaya... Where does he train? Fortis, I want to say. So he's in the States. I'm 99% yeah. on that one. So mostly, I'm going to use this very loosely, American-based fighters. You might be able to squeeze something out. But again, you have to have McGregor, you have to have Hooker, and you have to have Oliveira. I'm fine with it, but you're right. Like, Bellator's done it. It's a little Mickey Mouse of a thing. But I mean, hey, Mickey Mouse controls it now. So maybe, maybe they want to <laughs> do that. I'll tell you where it gets interesting is if you were to move Al, Al Iaquinta and Kevin Lee in for Felder and Fajaya. Just to make I mean, the bigger Iaquinta's fault could be before. I just think it gets, it gets interesting. The storylines get a little bit better. C is CBS, is, CBS is Brian Campbell would love your talk about future champ Kevin Lee. And the other thing, I mean, the guy's head tattoo. I don't like head tattoos that much. It's fucking bitching. Matt Allen loves it. <laughs> We love it. It's crazy. Who doesn't? I love Kevin Lee so much. I got to say that right now. That guy is awesome. Once he comes back from his knee surgeries, like Kevin Lee and Tiago Santos could set the world on fire. I'd watch those guys fight every week. Kevin Lee is, is like the exact opposite of one of those guys. Like um, he's almost the opposite of Khabib. Like Khabib has all the skills and really none of the marketability. Kevin Lee has all the marketability and none of the skills. You know, not the, he has the skills, but not the and, same way. And then he co he comes out of nowhere out of Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and knocks the fuck out of G uh, Gregor Gillespie. And then everybody's talking about a, um, about him again. I'm so excited. And then <laughs> Oliveira submits him, but we're still excited about him. Yeah. All right. Speaking of exciting tonight, uh, in mere in mere hours, Douglas Lima and Gegard Mousasi will hook up for a title fight. So this brings us to Bellator, which we don't talk about a lot for obvious reasons. Uh, maybe not obvious reasons. The UFC just has a lot more going on. There's more to talk about in the UFC. So I guess my question is on Bellator, and, and I'm, I'm barely 
fairly familiar with it. I, I hear that it has a little bit of a of a groundswell. It's grassroots over there. Uh, do you think Bellator will ever crack the code of how to compete with the UFC? Because they've gotten close before. They kind of decided that, okay, Saturdays are not for us. We can't try and guess when they're not going to be on because now the UFC is on almost every Saturday. They went to Fridays. Um, do you think they can ever compete with the UFC or will they forever be the show that every once in a while throws a worthwhile card at you? And when you look back, like Strike Force, like WEC, like some of these other organizations the UFC took out, you can go, oh, wow, this was a hell of a fight. Or this was a hell of a card on this night. Do you think it would benefit them to have great cards once a quarter or have okay cards every month? It's uh, that's a loaded question, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tease oh, yeah. you a little bit. I'm gonna make fun of you because the way that you structured that is an issue that people should have with Bellator. So you said they realized Saturday night was for the boys, the big UFC card. So we're gonna move to Friday. John, you said it in the start. It's a Thursday night. Bellator's tonight. Bellator yeah. switched their model to Thursday nights. This card's so big. It's Bellator 250 with a number like 250. Wouldn't you stack it? Wouldn't you make it big? Well, yeah, I mean, they have a middleweight title fight. Your former middleweight champ who got submitted by Rafael, or Rafael, sorry, Lovato Jr. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Lovato. It's a shame how his, you know, career's kind of unfolded after the, uh, what was it, the the brain diagnosis, the issues that he was having, that he had to vacate the belt. So you get Musasi back in, who barely beat Machida. Um, listen, I didn't even think he beat Slamenko. I thought the fight should have been stopped. Like, Gegar Musasi's Bellator run, there's a lot of dubs on his record, but if you watch the fights, they haven't been pretty. And I like Gegar Musasi. I think he's great. I think Douglas Lima mops the floor with him at 85. I love Douglas Lima. I, like, again, now I seem like I'm pumping my own tires. I've been a Bellator guy for a really long time. I have a lot of issues with the way that they do things. I think it's awesome that they align themselves with CBS. But PFL was on NBC, and were people clamoring for PFL on NBC? I don't think so. They're on ESPN. Are people getting really excited about the PFL on ESPN starting in 2021? I mean, apart from us talking about it, don't really hear a whole lot about them. So Bellator has to, I, I wouldn't say wait every quarter, but you remember Bellator NYC, right? Like, I remember where I, I was. Yeah. Oh, come on. It was Chael Son and Tito Ortiz. You remember oh, that? that's right. It was Fedor Matt Mitrione. It was the debut of Aaron Pico. I don't even have this up in front of me because I remember where I was. I was renting a house in Fredericton. We had the top half. My brother come over to watch it. We rented the pay-per-view. I was so excited for that. Like, it was a big event. Do more of those. Like, I realized Fedor was on his last legs. Well, he was on his last legs then, too. Chael Son and retired, but Tito hasn't, so maybe bring him back. I haven't fight Stefan Bonner. I don't know. Like, they, they, there's so many things that they could do. And here's another issue. They had two fights fall out today. I'm a little salty about it because I parlayed, and you're going to find this out in the future, people on the internet. I parlayed Douglas Lima and Nick Newell for a bill. Nick Newell's off this card because he tested positive for COVID. All right, that's fine. That fight drops out. Your co-main event also dropped out. Vida Ortega was supposed to fight, um, I think it was Desiree Yanez. The fight's out. Ortega tested positive for COVID and missed weight. Weighed in 126.2. There's a lot of fights on these cards that are really silly. Like the first fight on this card, on the prelims, was two debuting fighters. This is your 250th event and your first fight on the prelims is debuting pro fighters. Are you kidding me? Now I get it. We get a lot of uh, entertainment value at a lot of these lower fighters because what are they doing? They get one fight deals with Bellator. If you impress us, we'll sign you on for more. Will Morris was a guy like that. Had a couple fights, big finishes. All of a sudden, you're fighting Joe Schilling and you're tapping out after the first round. So Bellator has to do a better job. I know they just kind of throw darts at a board and they try and sign every big prospect they can. They just got uh, Usman or Magomedov. They get a lot like Joey Davis is a big prospect that you don't hear enough about because he's hidden with Bellator. The Fortune Brothers, do we hear a lot about them? I wish we heard more. Um, they have a lot of good prospects. But I find that their prospects get lost in the shuffle between good prospects, middle-tier prospects, and guys that are going to fight one time with the promotion. They lose in emphatic fashion, and we never hear of them again. So for me, it's promoting the talent a little bit more. I mean, they have their MVPs, their Douglas Limas, their homegrown stars that they end up losing to the UFC, like Ilwell Brooks, Eddie Alvarez, Michael Chandler, 
and so on and so forth. But they do have those homegrown guys and gals. Like Ali Malay McFarland, it was just announced she's got a fight coming up against Juliana Velasquez. That's exciting. Market that. But, man, you have fights on a night like this. You have three fight main cards. What? Why are we doing three fight main cards and then having Jack Swagger on the prelims against, and you love my Foghorn Leghorn impression, Brandon Carlton. Brandon Carlton. You know Brandon Carlton. Anyway. I don't understand a lot of the things that they do. The one other issue that I have, which they seem to have fixed, is their first fight card on CBS. I sat in this office right here in my glorious Team Canada jersey, and I watched the fights up on my television, and they didn't get done till like 1 o'clock in the morning. I live an hour ahead of Eastern Standard Time, so midnight Eastern, all right? Majority of your fight fans, you know, maybe Vegas is a fight capital. You got fight fans all over the world. They normally cater live pro sporting events in North America to Eastern Standard Time. Do they not? Unless the West Coast, like football team, baseball team, what have you. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. The answer is yes. I don't care if it's no. It's yes here. It's yes. Don't have fights end after 1 o'clock in the morning. You have European bands. You have European series. They're early, early morning Friday. How do you expect anybody to catch these shows? Nobody's staying up that late to watch Douglas Lima fight Gegard Mousasi. And if they are, they're the hardest of the hardcores, and you're going to get their money anyway. If you want to appeal to casual fans and grow your brand, have your fights early, have more fights than three on a main card, and start marketing your your talent. I'm so mad. That's the end of my rant. I love you, Bellator. I love you, Bellator. I think I said, you know what? What did I say? It was way back. It wasn't even early stoppage. I think it was between the links on uh, another podcast network. I said that Bellator was like that ex-girlfriend that used to drink too much. And then at a certain point, you just got to go, you're, you're too drunk, go home, go to bed. That's what Bellator is like. You're too sloppy. You're making mistakes. You're doing a lot of crazy stuff that you regret the next day. Just be wholesome, Bellator. Have a mocktail if you need to. Just take take a foot off the gas pedal. Guys, if you're wondering what life was like pre-COVID, pre-COVID was when I asked Craig this question. And <laughs> that was the longest response. We're only in segment in, in number five of the rundown. So because Sorry. Craig, there's nothing Craig didn't cover in that answer, I'll keep my response <sighs> short, which is maybe Bellator needs something like what Strike Force used to have, like a challenger series where you can put young fighters in there and you can you can kind of eat up space in between cards. Because the problem, Craig, is that if you try to have a full schedule of pay-per-view or non-pay-per-view, but like, you know, actual cards, like numbered events, if you stack them, you run out of guys to fill the other cards. Like, you know, if you put the fourth, if you make the fourth fight down on UFC, or I'm sorry, Bellator 250, a good fight, well, then who headlines the next one and the one after that and the one after that? You got you to gotta pray for great health to have that happen. I think if it were me, I would make Bellator a feeder league for the UFC. No, that's another organization. <laughs> I, if it were me, I would, um, you know, buy out some regional promotion, put a little money into it, say, you know, LFA is too big, but like buy out some regional promotion and say, I want all your fighters. Like, and then make that, be, make that be ultimately what Dana White's contender series is. And guys need to go from the Bellator, you know, the WWE does it, it's called NXT. Have a promote, have a show that is guys trying to get to the big show, and then you make the big show a bigger deal. That's the way I think Bellator should approach this. But instead, they want you to get your dick hurt for Bobby Volker and Sabah Hamasi. Remember when those guys fought in the UFC? Well, hey, by the way, they're fighting tonight with Bellator, so get excited about it. Bellator, I have news for you. Bobby Volker will never get my dick hurt. Sorry. <laughs> All, right, let's move on. All right, John. So let's transition from Bellator into something that I'm slightly less passionate about, but still passionate about nonetheless. Robert Whitaker's fresh off an impressive win over Jared Cannonier, and he said that he's got a few tricks up his sleeves for Israel Adesanya. So here's the question Did you see anything in the fight that Robert Whitaker employed against Jared Cannonier that makes you think that his next fight against Adesanya is going to be a lot different than the first fight? So one of the things on the Fight Night Picks recap show for UFC 254 that's on our Patreon is um, <laughs> that I said was, and I, it was on the broadcast. It's not like I, I you know, discovered anything, so some hidden treasure here or, or had some great piece of analysis. You know, Robert Whitaker looked real sharp with the right hand followed by the high kick. 
Uh, do I think that's going to surprise Israel Adesanya? I don't. I think that ro- there are parts of Robert Whitaker's game that are um, unique to other people who have fought Israel Adesanya. They don't occur on the feet. Whitaker is a lot faster than a lot of guys that Adesanya has fought. But we said that about Costa as well. And then Izzy does kind of does this thing where he just sticks you in mud. And if Whitaker doesn't have an answer to that, like if Whitaker can't get off first, if Whitaker isn't, you know, make, isn't putting Adesanya a little bit on the defensive, he might be in trouble. Now here's the bad news. He's great defensively. You know, Adesanya is a good counter puncher. He does a lot of things well in the standup. So you really got to, you know, um, you got to be coming in there with a unique set of skills, Liam Neeson style, that um, if you're going to, you know, mess around with Israel Adesanya. And I think that the kid is constantly uploading data and turning it into something in the cage that has everybody guessing. And right now he's got it all figured out. But again, the beautiful thing about the fight game is everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, and everybody has a plan until they really get cracked in the face. So if they can put real leather on it as Adesanya, you know, kind of like what Gaslam did, where he, where he makes this kid dig deep, then um, – and I think Robert Whitaker is capable of that. Again, this is the thing that makes Israel, the rest of Israel Adesanya's career so interesting. And this is not a backhanded compliment to Kelvin Gaslam. But if Kelvin Gaslam can do what he did to Israel Adesanya, there's a lot of guys that can do it. And I, and I think Gaslam's a talent. But there's a lot of guys who can do what Gaslam can do, and they have physical attributes that Gaslam doesn't have. Robert Whitaker is one of those guys. Chris Weidman's one of those guys, too. I mean, if we're playing MMA math, he beat Kelvin Gaslam. Next title shot. Chris Weidman off a win over Amari Akhmedov. No, John, while you were uh, kicking this off, and I know you were as passionate as I was about Whitaker uh and and my bellator rant but i had to pull up some (laughs) lyrics from one of my favorite songs can't do me nothing can't tell me nada don't quote me now because i'm doing the lombada make some noise by the beastie boys listen i don't see the second fight going all that differently now did i underestimate robert whitaker in his fight with jared cannonier 100 percent. full transparency yes i did i said cannonier was going to beat whitaker at the last second i got cold feet i felt like whitaker was going to beat cannonier but I'm a man of my word, and I kept my pick on Cannoneer. Now, Whitaker put on a masterclass. He looked better than he did in the Till fight, and he obviously looked better than he did in the Adesanya fight. Do I think he has more of a chance now than he did then? Sure. I think him uh, not being on such long of a layoff, he's, it seems like his health issues are a thing of the past. If he's 100% and firing all on all cylinders, I think he makes out better than his teammate Jacob Malkoon did against Phil Hawes. Remember that crazy wild knockout that they made you pay for is this where you curse because you're muted? So are you cursing? Is that what this is? Oh, I actually did mute myself. See, that's how <laughs> mad I got. They made you pay for that shit. There, I'll swear. UFC 254. You paid $64.99 in Canada to see a 4-0 fighter get his ass beat. And the only good thing the broadcast could say was, he trains with Robert Whitaker. There's fight tape on him. He trains with Robert Whitaker. That doesn't mean anything. That was ridiculous. That's where I stand there. I'm fired up tonight. But as far as Whitaker's chances against Adesanya, yes, he has a better chance in the first fight. Again, he's 100%, doesn't seem to have any, you know, nagging or lingering uh, injury issues, and he's been active. So I like all of that going into a second fight against Adesanya. I definitely think it goes differently. But again, man, this guy's a generational talent, Israel Adesanya. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, for me to cap it, I have no idea. Yeah, I, I, I want to see what he's got to offer, but I'm with you on a lot of points. I do think that um, that Adesanya's got something special. And, we, you know, there, there was a time we were comparing Robert Whitaker to George St. Pierre. Here's where this gets interesting for me. The first thing that Whitaker said, and people are going to hate this, and listen, I'm as much of a family man as anybody is. I love spending time with my kids. I love spending time with, the, you know, I, I, this is family is very important to me. When you, are a, when you are a cage fighter, and the first thing that you say when you talk about what's next for you in the cage after you just won, and you're like, see my kids, and do, I mean, that's a very sweet sentiment. But it, it makes me question if you are, if you have the level of focus that Israel Adesanya has. And it's, there's nothing wrong with being a great dad. But I don't know that, that you can be a great dad and then be as driven 
as someone who is not who doesn't have those things to worry about. That's all I'm saying. What about Dad Cowboy? I mean, listen, the cowboy, the cowboy rides away the George Strait song or like like a concert series that he had. But Cowboy, Dad, Dad Cowboy, fresh Dad Cowboy, recent Dad Cowboy. I mean, he did pretty good. He did, and that, that could, there, there could be a, a Dad Reaper. Is that what you're gonna Dad Knuckles? I don't know what we would call the Dad version of Robert Whitaker, where the Dad becomes the focus. But all right, Craig, we move on to sparring sessions. We've covered this a lot of different ways. Obviously, in Rankin, we're gonna cover it again. So let's try not to step on that segment, but we'll see. Um, let's talk about Khabib Nurmagomedov, and. A lot of people have a lot of differing opinions on Khabib. We know that he was dominant in his time, but how long that time was and who he fought, you can make heads or tails of that depending on if you're pro-Khabib or anti-Khabib. So I guess my question is, um, he's definitely been getting his flowers. He definitely took out McGregor, Poirier, Gaethje, submitted them all, all impressively. So my question is, do you think by the general MMA public, not by Craig Allen, Khabib is underrated or overrated? Underrated. Um, I threw it out there on Facebook. So our podcast just dropped from last week. And I went a little wild with the um, the thumbnail, as you probably did see, where I had Anderson Silva and I just put the goat with the goat emoji. That was my intro to last week's podcast. I threw that one out there in a couple of different Facebook groups. Uh, one of them was MMA debating groups. Maybe add them or, or do whatever you do with Facebook groups. I'm not a Facebook guy. I'm 26 years old. Um, but the thing that I put out there was, is Anderson Silva in the GOAT conversation? Or where is he in the GOAT conversation? Somebody said, well, my Mount Rushmore is like a Fedor, John Jones, GSP, and I don't know, insert Hoist Gracie. And I said, not Habib. And his response was, no, not Habib. I put him somewhere in the category of John Fitch. Are you fucking kidding me? Is that a joke? John Fitch? John Fitch had a great career, don't get me wrong. But John Fitch did, like, it's not even shit to Habib. The guy's undefeated. Like, again, now here's here's where we're letting it bubble a little bit. We're starting to simmer. This guy's a generational talent. He's arguably the greatest of all time. And I know, again, we're teasing it. We're going to get into that probably next but i think he's underrated i think it could be he's not from north america english is, isn't his first language this pay-per-view wasn't uh in prime time in the states it wasn't a big spectacle like you said he was fighting on the prelim cards not that long ago one of his wins in his win streak is daryl horcher a lot of people like to gripe on that one i don't know why um he lost to glace and tebow arguably like there's so many stupid little arguments that people have. Um, I would say underrated, but to me, he's he's top two. And it's difficult for me, and I'm incredibly biased, but for me, he's top two of all time. Um, and I think a lot of people underrate him. I agree. I think a lot of people underrate him. For me, he's a little overrated. Um, so, And obviously, we'll get to that here in a second. But I, I think part of the reason why he's overrated is he's kind of a hipster's pick. And he's a little bit like... A lot of the arguments that you make, and again, we're going to get into this, guys. We keep we keep teasing it. We're going to get into this in more detail. But for me, a lot of the stuff that you see from Khabib has to do with how do you view interim titles, right? Because the knock on Conor McGregor is that he never defended any of his belts. Okay, so it depends on how you look at Khabib. Yes, he defended it twice over Poirier and Gaethje. But the question is, how many champions – did Khabib ever defeat? Well, do you think Gaethje's a champion? And do you think Poirier's a champion? If you think they're champions, then it's three. If you don't think they're champions, then it's one. And now, if you start to get into the John Jones discussion, John Jones beat every champion, pretty much never lived at 205 pounds, except for Chuck Liddell. So we'll get into that here in a second. Again, we're stepping all over it, but that's where we're going. My point is, is that that's where I think that Khabib does get a little bit overrated. It depends on... I think this last three last three fights were amazing. Submitting McGregor, submitting Poirier, and submitting Gaethje are huge. But you can poke holes in all those guys as um, as fighters. And if I if I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up to what may be a future uh, revisionist MMA episode, <laughs> the question becomes: Is Khabib a great fighter or just ahead of the curve? 
meaning is he George St. Pierre, hold on, and John Jones, or is he Ronda Rousey and Hoist Gracie? Is his wrestling so far ahead of the curve that that becomes the reason why he's victorious? And, and again, he's victorious, so it doesn't matter. That's that's what I was going to say. Is it his fault that he's ahead of the curve? No. It's not his fault. And, and fighters, fighters, fighters that are ahead of the curve then become, you know, in that GOAT category because they're so much better, you know, they're so much better than their contemporaries. And again, this is the greatest that this division's ever been, and it's the most loaded division in MMA currently. Again, you can make arguments. Is Bantamweight better? Maybe. Is Featherweight better? I don't know. Is Welterweight better? Bellator had a tournament, but now they're champs fighting the middleweight champ tonight. So I, I don't know, but I, I really want to dive into our next topic. Let's do it. All right, guys. This week on Rank em, we're talking MMA goats. We're talking pound for pound, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of both. The, the, the impetus for this discussion is John Jones, who's coming out and saying that, that he does not deserve to lose his uh, number one pound for pound ranking based on um, Khabib's performances versus his performances. Craig and I touched on it earlier. Is it more about what is being done right now or what has been done in the past? Depends on how you look at it. If Jones was ranked number one pound for pound for a, a certain period of time, does he deserve to keep it if he never loses? So, Craig. Let's get into it. I am incredibly biased. So we'll talk about our list of, and, and there are guys in this list, but I mean, you could throw in a Rossi. You could throw in a Nunes. You could throw in a Cyborg. You could throw in Carlos Condit. No, I'm just kidding. But you could throw in a lot of different fighters into this conversation. But the fighters that we have so far, GSP, Anderson Silva, John Jones, Demetrius Johnson, Stipe Miocic, and Habib Nurmagomedov. And it's really funny because Habib, and it's not that funny, but Habib retiring last weekend, Anderson Silva, knock on wood, cross your fingers. He retires this weekend after he fights your eye hall. But where do these guys rank in terms of MMA goats? I mean, for me, incredible bias. The reason I got into the sport to begin with, to me, my number one's GSP. And the reason being is you look at the losses, Matt Hughes and Matt Serra. He, he had a hard time with mats the first go around, but he beat those mats and he beat them handily. So for me, he avenged his two losses and the, the names that he beat. I mean, you talked about it, interim champs. You talked about the fact that, uh, you know, and I brought it up, Carlos Condit is a joke, but you look at the wins. So loses to Sarah, but let's talk about uh, the wins. Carol Parisian at one point, big deal. Jay Huron, big deal. Jason Miller, not a bad win. Trig, Shirk. Penn, Hughes, Koscheck, Hughes, Sarah, Fitch, Penn, Alves, Hardy, eh, Hardy, Koscheck, Shields, Condit, again, interim champ, Nick Diaz, people's champ, Johnny Hendricks, probably lost it, Michael Bisbing, and I mean, Bisbing, again, that caps it, to have the, the two title wins to come back after such a long time off now, your argument to be would be, well, Craig, was Michael Bisping really that good? And to which I would say it was a competitive fight, but probably not. I mean, there were better middleweights in the world than Michael Bisping at that time. But still, you can't take away the fact that GSP beat Bisping. So for me, GSP is my number one. Again, ton of bias towards it. Hopefully people can understand that. But uh, to me, George St. Pierre is the, the greatest of all time. Did it with, and it's not to take away from anybody, but did it with absolute class. Hardly a blemish on his record. You don't really hear the the conversations about was he a clean athlete, was he not competing at a time when a lot of people were not. So I, oh, I have exist. all they exist. What's that? They, those oh yeah, they exist. exist. Well, I know they do, but I just I just drown them out. So for me, greatest of all time, and a perfect example of a martial artist, an exemplary Canadian, and somebody that I hold to the highest regard. Okay, so let's reframe this this question because i'm sure if you're if you're a real no, i don't fan, care i'm not changing my mind no, no no you don't have to if you're a real fan of early stoppage you will say to yourself well you guys have had this conversation a lot mount rushmore's goat you framed it differently and we have here's my pushback to that uh khabib Nurmagomedov making the statement he did changes it because in the past we haven't included him in this discussion so he changed the discussion right because is he the number one pound for pound so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna change it from goat because goat to me is Number one, not the issue at hand. It's number one pound for pound. And I think GOAT and number one pound for pound are different, meaning this is my definition of number one pound for pound, and people can argue this with me all they want. I've looked up the definition of it, and this is what I take from it. 
If all these guys were the same weight, who would win? All right? So here's where I give the nod to John Jones. And, and I will say this. Anderson and GSP aren't far behind, but Khabib is. If you look at everyone that John Jones fought, every single person, Rampage and Machida and Shogun and Shell and Vitor and all these guys that, that John Jones fought, whether Khabib is 205 pounds or those fighters are 155 pounds, and they get to – now, I don't buy into this if Shogun Hua was 155 pounds, he'd be different. No, no. He's 155 pounds, has the same power, same skills. He's just a smaller guy. All right. You mean to tell me that if all the guys that John Jones has beaten fought Khabib, none of them would knock Khabib out? One of them would knock Khabib out. Whether it be Shogun, whether it be Machida, whether it be Rampage. Chael might even out-wrestle him. Like, all the guys, Vitor, all those guys, somebody would get Khabib, and none of them got Jones. That's my argument. I think Jones is the number one pound for pound, meaning if everyone was the same weight and everyone was in their prime, John Jones wins. That's my thought on number one pound for pound of all time. Now, if I'm rephrasing it that way, you don't have to step off your guy because your guy, trust me, his accolades are there. George St. Pierre can strike with John Jones and he can um, wrestle with John Jones, 100%. So you can definitely keep George St. Pierre. But the reframing of the question, like I did, does it change your thoughts on it at all? You, you could certainly have Jones there. I mean, is there any anti Jones sentiment in from my side? If you want the biased answer, yeah, 100% there is. I mean, I, I didn't tell the whole truth at the start. See, Craig Allen and Matt Allen, when they were young bucks in 2008, 2009, getting into MMA. It was for George St. Pierre, don't get me wrong. But it was mostly for John Jones. And we watched John Jones all the way up through the prelims, through all those title fights. We always ordered back in middle school and high school GSP pay per views and John Jones pay per views. And I remember hating Ryan Bader for a multitude of reasons. But I, I, to me, I, are you framing it pound for pound or are you framing it goat? You got to be specific. Pound for pound, because we're talking about that's what if, we're talking about now. That's okay, if we're if we're going if we're going pound, is that he is okay. the best fighter right now? If everyone were the same weight, if if all of these guys decided to stick a needle in their rear ends and do a line of blow and hop in a cage, who would emerge victorious? Yeah, it's prob probably probably going to be John Jones. I mean, he's more weathered to it, right? But no, it's it's probably going to be John Jones. So yeah, I mean, I could understand if you if you'd have John Jones, your number one overall pound for pound. And the problem with it, and here's the problem with the lightweight conversation. Just focus on lightweight. Who are the lightweight pound-for-pound pound greats? You got your Habibs, you got your Frank Yeagers, your Branson Hendersons, your BJ Penn. Well, then we switch into a GOAT conversation. Who's the GOAT at lightweight? Everybody discounts BJ Penn because the end of his career, right? That happens. I mean, it's, it's fair. I understand it. I wouldn't even call it recency bias. You diminished your legacy. For this conversation, it's tough to not look at John Jones' recent run over again. Gustafson, Smith, Santos, Reyes. They they haven't been the type of performances that made everybody get up and get excited about John Jones. Does it tarnish anything? A little. I mean, is it his fault that it's not the same level of competition as it used to be and he needed the picograms? No. So to me, you just got to look at like prime everybody and then factor in what's happened throughout their careers i i do yeah i mean john jones at number one i'm fine with that i'll say this if all guys are at the same way and i had to bet my life on who i thought would win that fight it gets real tough for me between jones and silva silva in his prime was a sniper and he fought a 205 as well so depending on the way i i just feel like if, throughout all the different weights I trust Silva the most to win that, but um, I'll go with John Jones on one all time. Now, listen, you've done plenty of stepping on other segments, and you're about to step on the conversation. So let me cut you short because whatever you're going to say can probably be said there. Uh, let's move on, Craig, to fourth Graham. Uh, really quickly, uh, Javier Mendez said he didn't know Kabir Nurmagomedov was going to retire at UFC 254. This may sound familiar to fans of other segments of the show. Craig, do you believe him? I do. I actually do which might sound weird, but I mean, leading up to this fight, we talked about it. 
who's he going to fight? Who's next? Is it McGregor? Is it GSP? And then we started the show off and I said, well, if it's anybody, it's still GSP. For Habib to retire, I mean, I called my wife into the office as I'm watching the fights alone. And I said, hey, look at this. Like, Habib's retiring. Like, did it bring a tear to my eye? No. Did the Habib and his dad thing by BT Sport, the little cartoon, <laughs> did that make me cry? You're fucking right it did. I, I teared right up. I'll admit it. I think I admitted it last week, too, with my terrible audio quality. So I'll reiterate that. But, yeah, I believe him. I think he caught a lot of people off guard with this. And, and yeah, I, I who knew? You know, I, I'd like to say that I don't believe him because people always say, you know, things that, you know, they don't want. No, like, I'm just completely caught off guard with this. And you think, well, this is coach. This is, in many ways, his confidant. This is a guy who, in, in many ways, replaced his father. You know, Abdul uh, Manap Nurmagomedov had such a good relationship with Javier um, Mendez that that's really why, you know, Khabib's at AKA and why Javier has the place that Khabib's life that he does. But Khabib keeps stuff so close to the vest. And I feel like he's so, um, I don't want to say lack of trust, but the things that are important to him, I think he keeps confined to a very small group of people. And this would fall into that group. And I, I, I would think that Javier Mendez is in that group, but maybe not. All right, Craig, let's move on to one Twitter hitter. Uh, Bryce Mitchell finally got his camo shorts. Is this long overdue, right on time, or who cares? I think, you know, I'm decked out in Canadian camo here. Let's go into a little bit of detail, but not too much on this one. I mean, we're talking Twitter. I've already used up half the time that we get on Twitter. <laughs> Just getting ready for this. I, I, I Who cares? I mean... Really, it's cool. I saw the shorts. They look great. Uh, Real tree camo is not my thing. If that's what you want to wear to Canadian Tire on a Saturday when you're going to buy some Mastercraft, fill your boots. But I really don't care. Who's going to buy that kind of stuff, really? Are there many people that are going to wear that? I don't like camo. I don't. People up here wear camo all year round. It's the summertime, and you're wearing cut-off shorts and a camo T-shirt. Who are you fooling? We can see you. Yeah, you're right. We we can see you, um, but I guess my thing is is it depends on what this kid's trying to parlay it into. If he's trying to somehow parlay these camo shorts into being the next Donald Cerrone, good for you. Then then I, I can I can get down with that. If it's just camo shorts for the sake of camo shorts, and this is like some victory for him, then that's cool. But if if, if it's part of a larger plan for him, then that I like. Like if he's gonna wear the camo shorts and transition that into being the camo guy for the UFC and open a a line of camo stuff himself, that's smart. But if it's just about the shorts, I don't really care. He's parlaying himself really well. I talked about this in the prediction video, and spoiler alert, I took Andre Feely. I could be wrong. This could come out after then. I I don't care. I think it's a competitive fight. But overall, he has a really good YouTube channel, and I think people should check it out. Is he paying me to say this? No. Is this the second time I've said this this week? Yes. Yes. But I actually enjoy the content. I think he's doing a good job of setting himself up outside of the octagon that a lot of people don't do. Uh, So what's wrong with this? You're the only guy wearing camo shorts in the entirety of the UFC, and they keep adding more and more fighters to their roster as fights fall out. I mean, look at the fight that Kevin Holland has coming up this weekend against Charlie Ontiveros, whose opponent's records of his wins are 40, 30, and 1. So they're hiring... Anybody and everybody that has a pulse right now, if you can be unique like Bryce Mitchell and be the only guy with camo shorts and fill your mud boots and <laughs> get ready. Get ready. All right, Craig, Craig or Clegg, either one. Uh, let's move on to Clegg's posting. <laughs> let's move on to posting to the book. Well, Craig, it's on like Donkey Kong. Iron Mike Tyson and Roy Jones you will be fighting November 28th. And what type of fight is still up in the air? The talk is that this will be an exhibition, but neither fighter seems to want to adhere to that. Craig, give your thoughts on how interested you are for this fight, what you think will come of it, the whole, uh, quote, Black Lives Matter belt they're fighting for, all of it. What do you think? There's a WBC belt they're fighting for that's called like a front line. um, I'll have to get the particulars, but it's it's basically like a Black Lives Matter belt that they're fighting for. It's, it's, yeah. So, um... What do you think about this fight? How interested are you in it? Give me a number that you feel comfortable pay- paying for the pay-per-view if you're going to pay for it at all. What are your thoughts on the whole thing? Well, I mean, I did tell you I paid $64.99 off the hop to see 4-0 Jacob Malkoon get knocked out by Phil Hawes, who was 8-2 and in all of, what, 18 seconds? So, I mean, yeah, I'll pay. I'll pay. 
Uh, would I sooner have it on DAZN that I'm already paying for? Yeah, <laughs> but I don't want to pay for this. It's a flash in the pan. It's a gimmick. If the money goes to charity, then maybe. But, you know, if it's like, what was it supposed to be? $39.99? $29.99? Would I pay that? Probably. I think I've heard as high as 50 So what do you think about 50 Yeah. And I mean, you listen to both guys talk. They were both on the Joe Rogan podcast and they both kind of said, yeah, I'm I'm mixing it up in there. We're not just goofing around. This is this is a fight. So they both seem to take it pretty serious. I'm halfway excited. I had no idea until 50 seconds ago that there was a belt attached to this. Uh, does that change my opinion of it? Not a bit. I think it's kind of stupid, really. I mean, a guy in his 40s fighting a guy in his 50s. Are they both in their 50s? See, I, I, I was excited about it when I first heard about it, when it was supposed to happen, and then one needed more time, and I don't care. I don't care. Yeah, I think that a lot of these fights, you know, Tito and, and Chuck 3, which I was there for. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that, but, um, you know, they you, are... You were the guy in the blue trunks, right? That was me, yeah. Oh, um, okay. So I think that they... Um, you know, these fights are for the poster. These fights are for the walkout. These fights are for the first couple rounds. In my opinion, the best way to handle a situation like this is to make the fight short, shorter than a normal fight. Because realistically, Roy Jones nor Mike Tyson want to fight 9, 10, 11, 12 rounds, right? So if it's me, I make it between 5 and 8 rounds because it accomplishes two goals. One, it gives us quality boxing for those rounds because that's about as long as they're going to last. And two, it sets the table for a rematch. Uh, cause if they, cause if we do by the grace of God, as the sun shines on me, by the grace of God, get five rounds out of this fight, then let's book another five round fight instead of watching, you know, a 10 round, we'll get 10 total or 15 total if there's three. And then collectively we have 15 good rounds as opposed to four good ones and eight bad ones. If it's scheduled for 12, um, I just think that's the best way to go. And I don't know what people think. If, like, if they told you it was going to be a five-round fight, I don't know what you think you're missing if you're getting upset about that. Like, what? I get Tyson and Jones. I'll pay him 50 bucks. It's five rounds. You're getting five good rounds. So be happy about it, as opposed to, you know, five bad ones if they go 10 rounds. So, yeah, I'm with it. I'll always be with it because, you know, I, I like to see guys fight who didn't fight in their prime if they come in there fit and ready. That's my thing. Come in there fit and ready, and I'm down. All right, Craig. So, so, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's parlay this into MMA terms. So, how excited were you when Bellator decided a main event Fedor and Rampage at heavyweight? You know, I, I was excited. It would have been nice, you know, to see Rampage show up. In, in shape? shape. Yeah, Halfway? You know, not even like, here's the problem with a guy like Rampage. When he's in shape, he's 205 pounds. So you can't fight you can't fight Fedor at 205 pounds. So he had to go in there a little bit heavy. And, and the, the question is, how are you getting heavy? Are you putting on muscle? Are you putting on fat? Now, it looks like he put on fat. Um, so yeah, I do get excited about these fights because, you know, I, I, I quote I haven't quoted Shale yet so far, but I quote Teddy Atlas as well, in that, you know, champions remember. And you hope when they get in there, they can reach back and pull a little bit of their gr glory days out and show you something. Doesn't always happen, but that's the hope. All right, Craig, speaking of legends and what they accomplished, let's talk about comparing legacies. I'm going to make the question short so we can have a good uh, discussion about this. We kind of touched on a lot of it during this uh, episode. How do you think we should compare legacies? Do you think that we should compare fighters of different eras? Um, we're going to do it either way, but do you think it's fair to compare fighters of different eras? Or, and, when, and when we do, do we compare them at their best? Do we compare the full body of work? Because, you know, I saw this week, that BJ Penn has been catching a lot of hell and saying that he would have no shot against Khabib Nurmagomedov. They fought and, you know, even in his prime. And I think it, it was by a young guy and I won't mention his name, but he was, he, he obviously hadn't seen BJ at his best um, because, you know, BJ fought GSP at his best. And BJ, you know, he fought guys, Matt Hughes at his best. And to think that Jordan, that Khabib Nurmagomedov would just run out and take down George St. Pierre and Matt Hughes like it was nothing. I think some people would be, <laughs> in the words of Joe Rogan, I think you'd be surprised if Matt Hughes. And That's George, Brandon Schaub. Well, no, George Tate. Eh, eh, eh. Fair. Anyway. But my point is, is that I think that people would be surprised 
if they saw Khabib in there with a prime Matt Hughes or prime GSP. So how do you think we should compare legacies? Well, it's a funny question and it's not an MMA specific, like it's not an MMA specific type of topic. So I'm going to take it in a different direction. When we talk about basketball and if I asked you, you know, what, what's Michael Jordan best remembered for? What would you say? His years with the Bulls. Exactly. It's not that time that he came back with the Wizards, right? Right. So when we're talking about hockey and we go with Wayne Gretzky, what do we remember? Do we remember when he played for the Blues? Do we remember when he played for the Rangers? No. We remember when he played for the Oilers in the 80s in his prime. Right. So it's I, I look at MMA the same way. Do I discredit BJ Penn because of the losing streak he went on at the end of his career? No. Do I remember Rampage Jackson? Well, unfortunately, I kind of do. For the Fedor fight, the time that he fought Vanderlei for a fourth time in Bellator? No. Do I remember Chael Sonnen for the fights that he had in Bellator? No. Do I remember Tito and Chuck for Tito and Chuck 3? Well, just because you were there, no. <laughs> but no, like, I don't look at these fighters as, you know, they were past their prime, they had these fights, or, you know, they went on a huge losing streak. Do I remember Carlos Condit for the time that he fought Court McGee? Well, I mean, yeah, it just happened. But do I remember that, or do I remember the natural-born killer at the height of his prime? Well, I remember that guy. Like, you, you should look at it more as the, the fighter in their prime at their best rather than their full body of work. I mean... Again, the same thing goes in, in other sports. You can pick out different players, different sport. Like Wayne Rooney. Do you remember Wayne Rooney as like captain of Team England when he's playing for Man U? Or do you remember Wayne Rooney playing for Derby County as player coach? Like he's Jackie Moon these days. No, you remember Rooney 12, 13 years ago. So it's the same thing for me with MMA. I have something caught in my throat right now. So I'll take over. For me, it's... The way I look at it, I agree with you, but I guess you could look at it the same way as, you know, movies, right? Do you remember Robert De Niro for The Godfather and Goodfellas? Or do you remember Robert De Niro for Bad Grandpa or all these movies he's making now? And I guess the question becomes, the real question that I, that I want to pose to you is, once a fighter, and I asked this last week, but now we have a new set of eyes on it. Once a fighter reaches Hall of Fame status, is the rest of their career their business? Or should it affect, once you know, at the end of that fight, this guy's in the Hall of Fame. And you know, when certain fights happen, you know you know that after Khabib Nurmagomedov beat Conor McGregor, he was in the Hall of Fame. He knew it. He won the belt. He had already been so dominant. Had he retired after beating Conor McGregor, he still would have put him in the Hall of Fame. And then he went on and beat Poirier and Gaethje. So the question is, is what they do after their Hall of Fame status is cemented after their bust is created after their jacket is sewn is that their business and if it is should we dismiss it two more other sports that i'm going to throw at you it's one sport but okay wade boggs how do you remember wade boggs red I sox remember. legend yeah and then he played for the yankees do you know what hat he's wearing at the hall of fame the devil rays right the devil rays Okay, here's a topical one. Tony La Russa. What team do you remember Tony La Russa with? Was it this time with the White Sox? For me, for me, growing up, I remember Tony La Russa, Dave Duncan, and the Cardinals. I'm older than okay. you, but I'm an, I mean, I'm an A's fan, so I remember him with the A's. Okay, with, with the Bash brothers. All right, well, that's fine. I mean, my mom was a huge A's fan, so there's that. Now, that's how I look at Tony... <laughs> I look at Tony. Don't say that. I look at you, you owe her some money after all these years. You stepped out on us. I look at Tony LaRusse as the guy from the Cardinals, and again, all those teams of yesteryear. But he just signed like two hours ago to be the manager of the White Sox. He made it into the Hall of Fame in 2014. So does anything from the White Sox carry over? Well, if it's negative, no. If it's positive, sure. So that's yeah. kind of how I look at it. And I think that that's a ha like I, now that's a big tire pump to myself. But yeah, I, I think if it's good, sure. If it's bad, no. And if Larusa drives this young White Sox team that's fun to watch into the ground, man, I'll be mad. But if he makes it out successfully, the Padres should fire Jace Tingler and hire 80 year old Joe T Torrey to run that team. <laughs> you know, I think the, the the easy way to put a sort of a period on this is to say that you know. 
when you're looking at a fighter and you're comparing them, really the only reason why you're comparing them is to see how they would fare against each other. And if you're going to see how they would fare against each other, like in a cage, playing that hypothetical game, then you have to take them at their best anyway. So to say that the, did, did, did the guy that lost to Nick Diaz or worse, you know, when he was fighting Guida and all, does that beat Jay Penn? Would he beat Khabib Magomedov? Of course not. And listen, the other thing I want to just enter into this equation for, and again, we start the conversation here. This is Reddit stuff. You guys can, can, can ponder over this is that some guys, excuse me, are a little more protective of their legacy than others are, right? GSP is incredibly protective of his legacy. When he felt like the 170 pound division caught him, he went away and stayed away and only came back when he felt there was a guy. Listen, he could have fought Anderson Silva for a lot of years at 85. He wanted to fight. For I him. wish he did. I agree. But he could have fought Anderson Silva for a lot of years at 85 if he won that 85 pound belt so bad. But he waited till Michael Bisping had it. Okay, John Jones. The, the re, the, here's the here's the the connective tissue between John Jones and George St. Pierre. While you may say to me John Jones doesn't finish anybody anymore, I would say to you John Jones finishes fights and with his hand raised. And GSP after he got knocked out by Matt Sarah became a different fighter altogether. And he would just figure out how to win because his legacy was important to him. He submitted due to strikes. He didn't get knocked out. Right. So. Here's the deal. <laughs> I think Jones, I think Nurmaga Madoff, and I think St. Pierre are very protective of their legacies. That's why Khabib Nurmaga Madoff walked away when he did. That's why George St. Pierre walked away when he did. That's why John Jones fights the way he does. So now they're more protective of their legacies than BJ Penn is, than Anderson Silva is. Those guys just want to fight. They're fighters. They want to fight. Win or lose, they want to go out there and fight. So, which is why Anderson Silva was talking about maybe even fighting even longer after the UFC. So, I think that's the way we need to look at this. Who were these guys at their primes and had BJ Penn? Because a lot of these things are financial issues. You know, so if George St. Pierre is better with his money than BJ Penn is, he fights for a shorter period of time. Does it mean that he, anything else has changed about who they were in their prime? Other guys are, are, have financial issues, they fight for longer. Or, or they want they have different financial goals. Let's put it that way. So that's what I think is a good way to put it. All right. Okay, guys, there you have it. This episode, this very long episode of Early Stoppage is in the books, which is good. Be sure to comment under the video to let us know what you'd like to see next from the show here on YouTube, but also on iTunes and Spotify. We are uh, partners, colleagues of Joe Rogan on spotify we're trying to book kanye we're trying to get <laughs> alex jones we're trying to no we're now not that, now that we no, know we're not open, now that we know how open spotify is to having alex jones on this thing we're gonna see what he did um craig can be father craig on fp i can be father sm cornerman the fight has been stopped we'll see you next week craig say something witty let's get into it